I'm Junius Williams, your host on Everything's Political. And today we're going to talk about the general subject of the power of the vote. But it's a special edition because I went to Selma, Alabama for the 57th anniversary of Bloody Sunday to get the opinions of people, some old, some new to the struggle. But I wanted to make this a special edition since we need to find out what people were doing then to establish that right for Black people to vote and what people are doing now in memory of that fight. Because as you know, the struggle continues. So my co-host is Francesca Larson, and we're going to both talk a little bit about what I discovered. But this is a a unique event because uh, I actually went on the road. I know, you blew up the whole recording schedule. I did indeed. I did indeed. And instead of us having two or three people to talk to, we got about 30 or 40 people. I'm exaggerating for emphasis, but there were a lot of people I interviewed. I love that you just fact checked yourself. (laughs) So tell me why this year, what propelled you to clear your schedule and head down to Selma? Yeah. And at the last minute too, I, have a personal connection to that march, the march from Selma to Montgomery. I was uh, in Montgomery with SNCC. I was not actually on the march until the last day because most of the time I was in jail or in Kilby State Prison. Now, what happened to me? Why didn't I make the whole thing? Well, I was on my way to Selma But we stopped in Montgomery to check on the safety factor on the road, Route 80. Went upstairs at the SNCC office at the corner of Jackson and High Streets. Second floor, I call it the upper room. Met a man named Stokely Carmichael, and he said, what are you going to Selma for? We need you here, his Trinidadian accent, very pronounced. So we went downstairs, put our sleeping bags at homes they had assigned us, and the rest is history. So this was a very important moment for me just to relive, if you will. I had I didn't get to the actually see the Edmund Pettus Bridge until many years later, but uh, this was the beginning. So I... I- There's something about this story that feels untold because we see the the famous photos. We hear the oral histories or show that the march is linear, that it is a long line of folks walking together, experiencing, advocating, fighting together. And what we don't see is what's happening outside of those camera frames. The fact that this isn't a tight-knit walk, this is an extended movement that is miles and states wide. So you were part of this experience, but your experience wasn't on the bridge. Tell me more about where your experience was. Yeah, you're right. And you just slipped in that you were in jail too? Yeah, I was in jail, and the jail was filled, so then they sent us to Kilby State Prison. That's an important aspect of the story that's not much told because most of the attention was paid to that long, linear line, as you said. But SNCC decided to come to Montgomery after it started, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, after it had been responsible for most of the activity that preceded, quote unquote, the bridge, which you will see in the testimony that we're going to reveal here today. SNCC went to Montgomery, leaving its leader, John Lewis, on the bridge with Reverend uh, Hosea Williams, who was representing FCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was King's Group. 
It was decided, I understand, by flipping the coin that Hosea Williams would stay and march with the people, and of course, John Lewis stayed. But most of the SNCC people went to Montgomery because they were mad at King. There was something called the turnaround, turnaround Tuesday, they call it. You're going to hear a good man talking about that, where uh, King didn't want to defy a federal injunction, had never done that before. So he marched with the people just a little bit across the bridge and kneeled down and prayed and then turned everybody around and went back. Well, that that infuriated everybody. Uh, He did that in Montgomery, too. I don't know if we have enough time for me to get into all of this, but I wrote about all of this in my book called Unfinished Agenda, Urban Politics in the Era of Black Power. And I think I'm probably one of the few people who talk about that part of the movement that was in Montgomery in that detail. But anyway, so SNCC set up headquarters in Montgomery and had its own series of demonstrations, which was very important because it put another level, it put another tone to the movement because SELC and SNCC both wanted the same thing, but SNCC was with the young people. The leaders were young folks and themselves, and they attracted young people. And so the uh, people who were involved in the demonstrations in Montgomery were much more willing to take chances and, of course, paid the price because the they brought in the Ku Klux Klan on horses, deputized them. This is the story I was told. And they had long sticks that they used to beat cattle, so they beat us with those sticks. Then there were police on motorcycles who were also there to confront us. So the kind of violence that you see at the foot of the bridge when John Lewis got run down and got hit by the police, that was the same thing that was going on in Montgomery at the corner of Jackson and High Street because they didn't want us to march downtown. So what you're saying, and for us Northerners who don't have the geographic knowledge, Selma and Montgomery are about an hour apart, right? This is about- yeah. 50, 60 miles apart. 54 miles. There we go. Now you fact check me. I appreciate that. (laughs) Somebody's probably going to fact check me, but I think it was 54 miles. (laughs) And what you're saying is that you had a mirror image happening in two different places and that that experience wasn't just photographs or that one linear march. It was amplified. And your experience in Montgomery was pretty typical of what was going on. Right, right. They didn't have any kind of problem telling us, you can't march for the right to vote. And they just enforced it, not by negotiation, but by brute force. So what happened in Zelma happened in Montgomery and throughout the South. That's the other aspect of it. That's another reason why it wasn't so linear, because it wasn't just the Selma to Montgomery march or Selma and Montgomery action that got that voter rights bill passed in 1965 and became the voter rights law. It was people like that all over the South, the foot soldiers all over the South who were saying, we want the right to vote and we're using nonviolent confrontation to prove the point. I have a question for you that is... It's more of a question of you looking back. What kind of impact do you think that had on you? Watching the violence and brutality on your fellow organizers and on yourself, what kind of impact did that have on your involvement in the movement and also who you became as a person? Uh, First of all, it taught me how to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Number two, It did influence my organizing because, as I point out in my book, Unfinished Agenda, a man named Worth Long taught me how to be an organizer by what he did inside the jail cell in Kilby State Prison, where he saw we weren't getting enough blankets for everybody to sleep on the cold floor. And he stood up on the table. There were about, I don't know, maybe 75 to 100 of us in one cell. And he challenged everybody in that cell. If I can't get a blanket, then nobody should have a blanket. It was much more dramatic than that, but for purposes of time, I'm going to tell you. And right at that moment, 
he had organized that sale because everybody who, the stronger guys had the blankets. And they all came up and threw those blankets in the pile and made the jailers go back and get some more blankets for everybody. That was an organizing moment for me and for that cell, because after that, we did things as a unit. So those were the two biggest things. Plus, I made some friends of some folks that I've had the fortune of uh, having with me for a while, like Worth Long, who is now in his 80s and couldn't make this reunion. But uh, he and I talk quite a bit. There's something about listening to you tell these stories that I'm reminded of our last episode where we talked about healing. And there's a piece of this that I wonder, did you go to Selma this year as a part of your own healing journey? I don't think it was for healing, but it was for affirmation. You get a certain amount of strength from watching people that you knew or you didn't know. And we relive those moments, so to speak. But for the reunion it was really a different emphasis than on what would have happened had the folks in SNCC gotten together who were in operation in Montgomery. There were some SNCC people there, like Willie Ricks, which we're going to, I interviewed Willie Ricks. Willie was the, the author of the statement, Black Power. Stokely Carmichael publicized it. He promoted it, but Willie Ricks was the man who uh, coined that phrase. He was there, and there were a few others. But the SNCC people, who were mostly celebrated as they should be, were on the Selma side of the bridge. And it was good to hear people talk about SNCC, because most of the time folks just talk about Martin Luther King leading that march. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King was not in, SELC was not in Selma in the surrounding Dallas County at the time that SNCC went into and you're going to hear about a man named Bernard Lafayette, who was the first SNCC organizer to come to town. But I'm kind of taken away from the thunder of some of these people. So I don't want to talk too much about what they did. All right. Then why don't, why don't we set it up for those of us who might be walking around thinking that we know more about Selma than we actually do? And I'm going to take that hit for the rest of my generation who is not as educated as we should be. Can you lay out what was happening in the country and how we got to Selma? Selma, the Selma to Montgomery March was a culmination of a movement, a series of movements, mostly across the South, to get the right to vote for Black people. And it was clear that the white folks in those uh, mostly 10 states knew what the power of the vote was because they tried to keep us from voting. And they used whatever means was necessary, most of it brute force. They also put people off the plantations where they were working as sharecroppers. They burned people's houses. They lynched people. The Selma March itself was motivated by the killing of Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed, was shot by a sheriff from nearby Marion, Alabama, when he rose up to defend his mother, who was being brutalized. Why? Because she wanted the right to vote. So the people were, were ready to take their complaints, if you will, to Montgomery, the capital of Alabama, and the Dallas County. Voter League, I think that was the name of it, yeah, Ms. Boynton. Those were the people who had surrounded her, and we're going to hear more about her in a minute because uh, I'm now going to introduce to you a woman by the name of Verdell Dawson, Dr. Verdell Dawson, who's the chairwoman of the Tabernacle Baptist Legacy Foundation which was the first church to allow a mass meeting on the subject of voter rights in 1963. And here we have a clip from Dr. Dawson. Against the state of Alabama. Also entering 
time with Selma Dallas County in the 1920s of Samuel and Amelia Boynton. They started voter registration in the 1920s and it, it continued into the 1950s where there was some retaliation. But the important part about 1954 here in Selma Dallas in the state of Alabama is that the state legislatures banned the NAACP in all of Alabama. Mm -hmm. Into the 1960 and to 1963, when you look at Selma, there was less than 200 persons who were registered to vote out of a possible 15,000. The police department in downtown Selma had signs, names, where they posted the names of those persons who had been brave enough to register to vote. Because even though there were numbers of people who were eligible to vote, since the actions and retaliation of the 1950s, only 75 persons had even attempted to vote. But then came a young man by the name of Bernard Lafayette Jr. He was a founder of the School of Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Prophet Toss Smith, a member of the National uh, Movement of Freedom Writer. He was nicknamed Little Donnie because he was slight in stature, but he had a bold determination. In fact, he had gone to the end of to the Smith organization looking for his own campaign, but they told him you cannot have one. Everybody has been assigned, there's no more anything anywhere. And this is 1963, and Birmingham is in full flames. Uh, Montgomery is over, even in Mississippi, with the, uh, all of the activities over there. Everybody had responsibilities that were normal. Lafayette Jr. would not accept that. Finally, he came to Selma because no one else wanted to come to Selma. And coming to Selma, he worked with Mr. and Mrs. Sam Boynton, Mrs. Marie Foster, and other members of the Dallas County Voters League. Mrs. Foster, by the way, had been one of those persons who had been having voter registration classes in Selma, and many of them were held in the basement of this church. But when I came to Selma, his difference was his connection with the youth, yes. with the students of R.B. Hudson High School in particular. And R.B. Hudson at that particular time was a powerhouse of schools. It was tops in academics, you name it. It was up there, as we would say in Alabama, with Parker and some of the other prominent segregated high schools. So when uh, Bernard connected with Mr. Boynton, and Mr. Boynton had been attacked and beaten, and he was in the hospital. And then in 1963, he passed. So now I sent out a call to all of the colored children in Selma, asking them to host a memorial service and the first mass meeting. Only the audacious Dr. Lewis Lloyd Anderson of Highland Avenue. He was full of himself, <laughs> dedicated to the book of life, and he wasn't going to allow anybody to push him around. <laughs> so after he had volunteered Tabernacle, he went to his deacons, who were professors at Southern University, and they told him, you can't do that. Because that was, don't you know the struggle that I'm bringing? Our grand uh, fathers and grandmothers had in building the church that we have. We don't want our church bombed like Montgomery and Birmingham. He said, okay. 
I tell you what, we will have a meeting on the outside, on the steps, and I will tell everybody that you're too scared to have it on the inside. <laughs> now they knew that Reverend Anderson meant what he said. So they back now, and we say at Tabernacle, Reverend Anderson thrust us yeah. into history because of his bravery and courageous acts. Was there a specific event that most inspired you over the weekend? Always when I come to these uh, anniversaries, I get to meet new people. I get to listen to the stories, both old and both new. But the most inspirational is something they call the foot soldiers breakfast. And th that's when the people who actually march the march, who walk the walk as well as talk the talk, they were the foot soldiers. And nowadays you're finding fewer of the actual folks who were on the bridge or who stood up for the right to vote because they're dead. But their their relatives are there, their sons, their daughters. And that's what you're going to hear now. These were the people who handed out the leaflets, who registered the vote, provided transportation, did the office work. These were the people who were on the front line of trying to get the right to vote for black people. And this was the these were the people in Selma who did that. I love that they collect these oral histories. And I think this is something that I've also really admired about your work, Junius, is that it's the work of the folks who are organizing outside of the photographs. And it's where we learn the most about how to organize and how to build a movement. We've talked a lot about direct action. We've talked about organizing. We've talked about even the administration of organizing during this, this season. And these oral histories show that there is a role for every type of skill set in a movement and that these movements require all of us. It doesn't just require the person who can pick up the mic. It requires the person who knows how to make a pamphlet and get it distributed really quickly so that folks show up on the day of the action. And I think in our country as a whole, we sometimes take those roles for granted, but I love being able to hear these stories and see the reflection that there's, there's space for all of us. So tell me about the first, the first foot soldier. The first person we're going to hear is uh, a storyteller picking up more on the details about Bernard Lafayette, who was really a hero in that town. By the way, there are no young people in Selma who do not know these stories. Everybody knows. Now, whether they believe in the vote or not is another question, which we're going to deal with long, a little bit later. But these stories are celebrated every year. They're celebrated in schools. They, they have a parade. Folks know, and they know, a lot of people know about Bernard Lafayette. I don't know about the youngest generation, the, the current generation now, but uh, they know that they stand on the shoulders of giants, and this is one of them. So you're going to hear about Bernard Lafayette, who came to uh, Selma as a SNCC organizer. He said he wanted to volunteer, and uh, SNCC back in the early days, they had a map, and they had people in all of these different places around the South where they had folks deployed to, to raise the question and to get the people organized. And uh, so he said, there's no pen here in your map. What's that? that? Oh, that's Selma. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there for two reasons. The people are scared and the white folks are too brutal. So he went anyway. So this is the first thing you're going to hear about how Bernard Lafayette came in and organized the people. I feel like that's a phrase that we're going to hear a lot of. They went anyway. Just like you went to Montgomery anyway. But he and his buddy Charles Bonner, his best friend, 
uh, happened to meet Bernard Lafayette when he came to town. I know, does that ring a bell to you, Bernard Lafayette? Yeah. Okay, an aide of Dr. King. He was one who uh, was taking a break from seminary school and he decided to go come to Selma. He went to Atlanta, there was a big X over Selma saying, you don't want to go there. But he said, well, maybe I'll go scout the area and check it out. Well, he came to Selma and uh, he talked to some of the leaders and so forth and tried to get the adults to get together and go register the vote. That didn't happen. So then he appealed to students. One day, Charles Bonner and Cleophas were in a car. So Bernard just got behind him to help him push it out of the street. Well, after that, he was able to talk with them. And he began to uh, tell them about the movement and if the teenagers would get together, they would bring freedom to self. They, they told him, told them, Bernard did, to get all your classmates, all your friends and neighbors, and meet us at Tabernacle Baptist Church after school on Monday, and we will have a meeting. We'll get you organized. So 39 students showed up, and therefore they began to organize. They had Charles Bunner as the president, Cleophas as the uh, coordinator of the canvas committee that would go door to door knocking. They had a telephone committee. They had secretaries. They had a complete organization. They even had a recreation committee because they were, after all, they were teenagers. So they had to have some fun even as they began to get involved in the work. They began to practice nonviolence. You know, this had to be a transition from being a violent culture to how now you're going to take blows and how to protect yourself, get in a cradle position, and therefore you take the blows on your shoulders and your back and so forth instead of your head and so forth. So they went through that. They did this from March all the way up to about September. So they would get on Bernard and say, Bernard, when are we going to march? We know what to do. And Bernard said, no, no, you're going to get your time one day. Well, the time came after the bombing, the bombing of the church in Birmingham. Charles and after so many of the students had been trained on how to conduct themselves on the march, they heard that the church in Birmingham had been bombed. They left Morningstar Baptist Church in the car with Charles, and they said, what happened? That's why we were in church, this happened this morning. Let's get the kids together, let's go march, let's do something. We need to go head on. So anyway, they began to meet at Brown Chapel, organize and go to the march. So with that, the movement was on fire. The enthusiasm and so forth, they were ready and they began. That was the first wave. I didn't participate until the second wave. We had a march out of school. There was a flyer that came around and said, we're going to have a student uh, meeting at Ward Chapel. This would be the staging area before going to Brown Chapel. Well, with that, we got the flyer, and we, at the, after the first period, we began to walk down toward the front door to walk out of school. As we got down there, who would we see but the principal, the assistant principal, the truant officer, and the white superintendent there to block our exit. Okay, there was a, a pause. They stood about 10 feet away from us and we stopped. Then a brave student went to the door and pushed it open and walked out. Then we kind of began to flood on out the building. And as we walked out, uh, the principal had been saying to us, go back to class, ain't gonna be no marching today, go back to class. We continued to march. And as we walked out and got to toward War Chapel, once we got it assembled there, uh, Reverend James Bevel told us, said, uh, did you know when you left the school, the principal said to, the superintendent said to the principal, could you stop, could you not stop these students? And the principal kind of said, no, I, you saw I tried. The slap occurred because, you know, the principal was so used to uh, being obedient to what the superintendent had said over the years, and he had been the original principal at Hudson High School from 1950 all the way up now to 65. And he was loved by the black community, you know, by the students and so forth. To see him disrespected that way only put some indignancy into us to say, you know, we will never go back to school until we get the right to vote and our rights are recognized. But in that point, we went to Brown Chapel and then this group was trained on how to, again, protect ourselves if we're marching. And so, uh, 
this was one of the first marches I ever went on. My mother had told me now, they told us we gonna get fired if you go march if our kids participate. Well, I got back home ahead of her after marching. We didn't get arrested that time. We got, we were able to march and then go back home. Well, when she came home after her school teaching day, she looked around and said, let me check the news. Well, I was trying to get my nerve up to tell her, Mama, I marched today, even though I had been going to the meetings, and she knew about that. But she looked and saw me on TV before I told you not to march. I said, Mom, I've been trying to tell you since you came home. But that was the way uh, we, you get there and the enthusiasm of the students, you know. Uh, you get to sing one of those freedom songs, there was no way for you to say, I'm not going to march because ain't going to let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I'm going to keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up the freedom land. So, you know, that enthusiasm captivated me. And before you know it, I'm marching too. I'm signing up on the list tomorrow. And so from being kind of a violent person to becoming uh, dedicated to the movement was a kind of a transition, but we made it. And because of the encouragement of Dr. King and the others who had sacrificed their lives, who had gone to jail, who had, they weren't leading from behind. They were leading from the front. And so they gave us as students the nerve to even with fear go out and march. And I was talking to one of my classmates this morning <laughs> You know, we didn't know what we were really in for. We were just 16 years old and younger, just saying, okay, we were participating eagerly to do so. So uh, I, I don't have much time, but I would say that uh, during the presidency of uh, uh, President Barack Obama, uh, under the Honorable Terry Sewell, who was the congresswoman from this district and whatnot, they were able to have a congressional gold medal ceremony in the Capitol in the basement of the Capitol building. And we, were, went, we went there for this in 2016. And they awarded the gold, this is a bronze medal, but they had the gold medal that was awarded to Congressman the Honorable John Lewis and also uh, Reverend F.D. Reese, who uh, Dr. Fred Douglas Reese of Selma, Alabama, he received those medals, the, the two of them, on behalf of the foot soldiers. So they did, we did get recognition on that. Now, to say this, I must admit that there were soldiers throughout the United States and other cities that supported the movement, that marched and demonstrated. So we were maybe set aside to, to receive the honor, but this honor is given to all the foot soldiers throughout the United States. Right. Albany, Atlanta, Montgomery, Birmingham, who are responsible for the voter's right bill getting passed. And so, with that, and with my time frame, I guess I would call it a day. Thank you so much for letting me share with you. What is his name? I don't know. I didn't. I, I didn't hear it. Okay. Uh, All right. What is his name? Attorney Fire Rose, uh, Teray, will you come make your announcement, please? Yeah. Okay. I welcome everyone on behalf of the Bridge Cross and Jubilee. It was like 28 years ago uh, that we conceived a way to preserve this history. And I would like for the board members and the people who work with the Jubilee to stand up real quickly so you know who will keep us keep this vision going for the last 40 years, 30 years. These are some uh, very important announcements I need to make. Because the Vice President is coming, there have been so many changes. And I understand that the Secret Service is concerned about her welfare because we are in the middle of a very dangerous place. The South and the North, these are still very dangerous places when it comes to freedom fighters and anybody that stands up for right. So they've changed the schedule again. The pre-march rally will be at 12 o'clock, not 1 o'clock. That's when we need the foot soldiers to come and tell their stories because they are controlling the program at the bridge. Initially, they told us that all your groups can t take pictures with her and da-da-da, the Freedom Singers can sing, but they have limited us 
to nine people to speak before she speaks. There are five members of the cabinet here, Minister of Transportation, HUD, uh, the Education, all these people here, but we're asking them to do something for Selma, because Selma gave so much. But Selma now is one of the poorest cities in the nation and one of the most poorest cities in the nation. So it's not enough for famous people to come and cross that bridge with us. We must demand that they do something for Selma. So what I want you to do, when they limited, they said only six people could see and take a picture with her. I said, take my name off because I'm more. it's more important that we do something for Selma. Now, that didn't work out well. They said, since you are the chief coordinator of this, it would not look good if we took your name off. But I want y'all to know from the bottom of my heart, I do this work not for recognition, because I never get recognition. If I did it for recognition, I wouldn't do a damn thing. I wouldn't. So please try to be at the Brown Chapel in front of the church tomorrow at 12. Now, this year, we didn't, we're not charged. You don't have to pay for anything for soldiers. But in order to get into the foot soldiers honoring tomorrow, you have to go to the festival today to get your armband, which is free. You go to the festival today, which is free. They give you your armband. So tomorrow, we have the gospel tribute to the foot soldiers. We do it every year. A special gospel tribute to the foot soldiers. Um, and that will be immediately after the march. But in order to get into that free, you have to have your arm banned today. The vice president will actually speak at 2 o'clock sharp. At 1.30, all of the ministers of education, HUD, and all of them will speak. We have been pushing for at least Charles Malden, at least one of the foot soldiers, to speak in her presence. That's what we're still pushing for. They still have not agreed. But they did agree that the freedom singers could sing. Now, the freedom singers are not just singers, they are activists. So maybe one of them, Charles, if we can't make that change, would have to tell the story. We are marching all the way to Montgomery this year. All the way to Montgomery. When we leave the bridge on Sunday, SCLC will take us the first three miles. Dr. William Barber and Jesse Jackson will take us the next eight miles. Uh, Al Sharpton will take us the next. Um, repairs of the breach, NAACP, League of Defense Fund, I, got, I don't want to spend too much of your time. Um, uh, Black Voters Matters will take us so many miles. League of Defense Fund will take us so many miles. AFLCIO, this is the most collective march we've had since the 60s, y'all. And as many of y'all can march with us at least one of those days, it would be awesome. The last thing I want to say is this. I founded the Jubilee 28 years ago along with Amelia Boynton, Marie Foster, C.T. Vivian, and people that were a part of that movement. This has been a 27-year journey of love. We don't get paid to do this jubilee. We have never gotten paid to do it. And even though the local whites put out the lie that I stole money from the museum, and that's what it was, a lie, to try to stop this institution from growing. And let's be clear, they lied on King. That's right. They lied on Malcolm. That's right. They lied on the Black Panthers. That's right. And when the lies didn't work, what did they do? They put them in jail. That's right. And if they couldn't, Stop their voices from putting them in jail. They killed them. Right. The Black Panthers were killed. Anytime you stand up for justice, they will demonize you, incarcerate you, or kill you. And brothers and sisters, y'all have to understand this game they're playing. Because white people can't control the, the Jubilee in Selma, they're constantly attacking me and my family. And you are our protection. If you don't protect us, nobody will. If you believe the lies, they will. So I appeal to you foot soldiers, don't stop marching. I know you marched in 65, but some of y'all stopped marching. That's right. And you know I'm telling the truth. Right here in Selma, there are men that have been in jail for 10 years without a trial. Right here in Selma, 
There are black men and black women who are stopped every day and falsely accused of drugs because we got a sheriff who I call the new Jim Clark. His name is Grant. He is the new Jim Clark. Who is going to march against the new Jim Clark? That's what I want to know. Yes, I appreciate everything you did in the 60s, but we're going backwards. We're going back. And if you're going to stop marching, if you're going to stop marching, you may as well go back home and just write your history book because we're going backwards. I didn't mean to say all that, but let me say this. Y'all have our Jubilee newspapers. We didn't want the Swiss soldiers to have to pay for anything. It's a wonderful paper. But if those of you with means who are not foot soldiers, you can help keep the Jubilee going uh, by texting Selma 444-321. Even though this Jubilee is free to you, it's not free to us. Just putting up that stage and that sound is $25,000. So one way you can help the Jubilee and the museum to keep going is to give whatever you can to that number, Selma 444-321. I think that's right. Well, again, thank y'all. And I don't care what happens, please be at Ch Brown's Chapel at 12 o'clock. I know Willie Ricks is going to be there because he never stopped marching. Thank you. Since our overall purpose in this series of episodes on Everything's Political is to teach you how to organize, I have to point out how Bernard Lafayette took advantage of an organizer's moment. Here were teenagers he wanted to recruit. There was a car that needed to be pushed, so he helped and gained the trust and confidence of these young people. Then he could talk to them about the movement. Can we unpack that for a moment? So if you're putting on your Professor Williams hat, what was he doing with those teenagers? How can another organizer use that model in their organizing? It was like Worth Long in Kilmer State Prison in 1965 when we didn't all have a blanket. Remember that? Well, here were some students, some high school students. He didn't know them, but he was driving past and saw the car and they were trying to push the car. So he jumped out to try to help them and evidently he introduced himself and they pushed the car over. And after that, a kind of a friendship was established. So eventually he was able to get these students to come to this meeting. An organizer's moment, I call that it's something that you really have to improvise. There's no set standard for what an organizer's moment will be. We all have them. I've had them. This was his. You just have to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. And this was one of those kind of situations where you, <laughs> you didn't do either one. You just acted upon your instincts. I think those instincts, though, are it shouldn't be taken for granted either. Because I assume that he did this over and over and over again. You find an opportunity to build trust, and then you're able to use that opportunity to welcome and educate and motivate and then activate. That's true. That everybody can't be an organizer. You have to trust yourself to begin with, and you have to know what you're trying to do. The most important thing is to know what your goals are and then to... Uh, have a plan for how you're going to get there. In this case, the older people were not responding to his uh, pleas to come out, let's get organized. So he went to the young people, which was often the case throughout the South, whether you were in Mississippi, whether you were in Birmingham with Dr. King. Remember, Martin Luther King couldn't get the folks in uh, Birmingham to stand up for the movement, the movement to break down the segregation in public accommodations. So he went to the schools, and the kids marched out. And when the kids marched out, the police responded as police do, and uh, eventually started putting fire hoses on these kids. It went all over the world, and that's how 
he broke the spell of Montgomery, I'm sorry, of Birmingham being the toughest city in the South to organize. That was an organizer's moment. King was a good organizer, no doubt about it. But the style between SNCC and SELC was different. How so? SELC was mostly composed of mature preachers. That was the leadership. SNCC was composed of college students and young people who had not necessarily gone to college in these various locations. So young people have a certain amount of freedom that old people don't have when it comes to being daring. Young people don't think about death as much as older people do. We're still at the foot soldiers' breakfast. This is an interview of three people who were definitely foot soldiers in Selma. I heard an interview being conducted with these three folks by a television crew. And so I just stuck my microphone out. And we got first, we're going to hear from Jimmy Webb, then Evelyn Morris, and the third speaker is Charles Malden. And their stories speak for themselves. I was one of the original four (laughs) members that uh, organized the movement here in South. And uh, we uh, led the first demonstration here. And I went to jail for 17 times and carried quite a few of you youngsters to jail. And I'm proud to say that I left them there as long as I could. But uh, (laughs) at any rate, uh, on Bloody Sunday, uh, after John Lewis and I had announced that we were going to march each other to Montgomery uh, to carry a make- makeshift casket of Jimmy Lee Jackson to set on George Washington. Yes, right, George Washington, right, right, right. right. Uh, that's when the original uh, was organized, and uh, I happened to be a part of that. And uh, Bloody Sunday to me was I had a bucket of water with rags in it because we anticipated tear gas and things of that sort. And in addition, prior to that, I'd say that I was present when Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed in Marion, Alabama. I was present when James Reed, the Unitarian minister yes, of Boston, was yes. killed at the Civil War. James Reed. Yeah. And I also was a member, uh, well, I was a field secretary for SNCC, and uh, I witnessed, I sat in meetings with Martin Luther King, and we argued in the meetings because we had different philosophies in yes. SNCC than yes. SCLC. Right. Yes. A right. oh, lingo here, man. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, Stokely Carmichael and I brought Malcolm X and Selma from Tuskegee. And a week or so later, Malcolm mm. was assassinated. Right. Stokely Carmichael mm. and Willie Squire and I go to Atlanta, Georgia to pick up Ruby Dollars. And we drove to Malcolm X's funeral in New York. Yes, sir. And there we had fundraising activities and uh, that sort to send money to SNCC. After Bloody Sunday, I went on a fundraising tour for SNCC. <laughs> throughout New England, and they would donate a check to send to SNCC, and they passed the hat for me. And that concludes basically what I like to say. I have three or four books inside of me. Yep. And I'm writing my book now also. The women, because the women have been ignored. The women have, and listen to me please, the women have been ignored. The foot soldier women. There was no one in the world as brave as Betty May Fikes who went on to continue her life, continue as a foot soldier, all of her career with John Lewis. She was the woman that traveled with John Lewis every place that he went. And she told her story. I'm getting ready to tell Betty Fikes and my story now. A book will be coming out at the end of the year because the women of the civil rights movement our story has not been told. I'm not telling my story, and I'm not telling Betty's story, and Charles Bonner, and Cleofus Hobbs, and Terry Shaw. I'm not telling it for profit. Understand me. I'm telling that story, and that book is coming out to help the children of Selma. Yeah. Charles yeah. Malden organized no, his foot day. soldiers breakfast every she, day. She, she's here downtown. Charles, you also on the bridge, March 7, 1965. Yes, I'm on the bridge three times. First on a Bloody Sunday, secondly on Turnaround Tuesday, mm-hmm. and third march from Selma to Montgomery. I was a monitor there. I remember being at the top of what they call Goat Hill and Dexter Avenue, just above Dr. King's church, looking back at thousands of people 
black and white, Jews and Gentiles of every faith and every denomination are coming to Alabama to uphold what was right and what was best about America. That was probably one of the most glorious days of my life, looking back and seeing America united behind what America was supposed to lead. I was a student leader after uh, Jerry and uh, Reagan came about. As a matter of fact, I remember Terry Shaw mm -hmm. lived right mm -hmm. directly across mm -hmm. the street from me. Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. I was maybe about 14 or 15. Yes, you did. And he invited me to go to the uh, march on Washington. Yes, but you did. I was at a very low level because at that time, a very young person. And the idea of going to Washington was unheard of given my family dragging right out. Uh, but uh, <laughs> after meeting Bernard Lafayette, he asked several questions like, yes. why can't you drink out of the white fountain? Mm. Why can't you go to the white school? Why yeah. can't you go to the white house school? And that began to, uh, I became pregnant with the inconsistencies in my life. Mm. There are a couple of things I want to talk about with respect to these commentaries. The main one being Jimmy Lee Jackson. man said, I think it was uh, Jimmy Webb said that he was there when Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed. Jimmy Lee Jackson was in Marion, Alabama, and a part of a demonstration for the right to vote. And a policeman attacked his mother. It was a voter registration rally. And he didn't want that to happen. Nobody wants to see his mother manhandled. So he went after the policeman and the police shot him. He was killed. That was one of the impetus for the march. The other is something called Turnaround Tuesday. This is when Martin Luther King, after Martin Luther King had been asked to come in and help lead the march to get more publicity because he was who he was, King did not want to lead a march that was subject to an injunction imposed by a federal judge. He hadn't done that before, and he didn't want to do it again. So at the same time, he had people who wanted to march. They were mad. They went sensed about everything that was going on, especially the killing of Jimmy Lee Jackson. And so King said, we're going to march across the bridge, but we're not going to cross the line that the judge had drawn. And he did that. They kneeled down and prayed, and then he turned around and marched back. Now, the people didn't know that was going to happen. They thought they were on their way to Montgomery. So the people were mad, especially SNCC. And even though John Lewis, I believe, stayed with that march throughout, most of the SNCC people went to Montgomery and started their own separate set of demonstrations. And that's how I became involved in the quote unquote Selma to Montgomery March, I came in as a then as a volunteer for SNCC because I stayed in Montgomery. I didn't know all of this was happening. I was on my way to Selma. I thought that's where I was going, but Stokely Carmichael said, What are you going to Selma for? We need you here. And that's where we stayed. Now this next set of voices that you're going to hear were also people who were at the foot soldiers breakfast. In the tradition of mass meetings, uh, everything is not done with words, but sometimes with song. And this is a young lady named Ali Makatow who offered a song and her testimony about the importance of Selma and her mother's role in preserving this history. When will my people learn? When will my people learn? When will my people learn that we need a revolution? We are only solution. When will my people learn? How y'all doing? We share this history to remind our young people that yes, 
The stories in the 60s and the 70s are very relevant. But the fight is today still. They're trying to turn back the clock. Go ahead. We must fight for the vote. And we must heal our communities. Our communities are dying. It does not make sense that 22 people were murdered in Selma last year in a town that only has 17,000 people. Carlette West is our next speaker. She is the granddaughter of Lonzi and Alice West. She and her sisters were there to represent her mother, who received an award for her role as a foot soldier in the movement, but was unable to come on her own. She told the story for both of her grandparents. Before we play this one, I love... I love the fact that this is oral history, that it's getting passed down generation to generation. There's something that's really special about that because we think about those oral histories normally as family stories. And this family story that they have is a family story that impacts who we are today as a nation, which is really powerful. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, Welcome to the breakfast to our distinguished guests and the people that put this program together. My name is Carlette West, and I am the oldest grandchild of Lindsay and Alice West. I am honored and proud to accept this award on behalf of my grandmother. She could not be here today. Um, My grandmother and grandfather spent a lot of time uh, registering people to vote and feeding the civil rights workers during the movement. Their home at 313 EGWC Homes was used as a freedom house for the civil rights workers, both black and white. A lot of famous people ate and slept at their five-bedroom apartment. People like uh, Congressman John Lewis, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Stokely Carmichael, Jonathan Daniels, H. Rap Brown, James Orange, Hosea Williams, Andrew Young, and many other Unitarian ministers. Um, Most of the time, my grandfather, Lonzy, he uh, participated in the marches, but Grandma Alice would stay at home with the children because they had about 12 children, 11 children, and so she would cook the dinners and serve the uh, ministers. Um, And usually, uh, Grandpa uh, Lonzy, he would go up to, uh, to the marches. My grandfather, Lonzy R. West, he received several broken ribs in Bloody Sunday. He participated in the Poor People's March in Washington, D.C. He lived in Resurrection City in Washington during the march. He was arrested for a block in the door to Senator Byrd's office. He was invited to the White House by President Johnson to participate in meetings at the signing of the Voting Rights Act. Thank you. Just to tie into something that you said earlier, Francesca, to me, the foot soldiers breakfast is always so personal. That's why I think it's one of the most well-attended events by the people in Selma, because the older people of Selma and their families get to celebrate who they once were and still are. And this is a song composed and sung by a singer there who sang a whole lot about what it means to be just involved in struggle. So y'all can do me a favor, look at the person next to you and say, neighbor. Oh, that's the wrong neighbor. Go to the other neighbor because they ain't talking loud enough. Say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Keep moving forward. The song says, smile, smile. When you're feeling down, hold your head up high. Dry those tears from your eyes Because you're one step closer For what God has for you So keep moving forward I Keep moving forward Well, I'm going to ask you a personal question now. All right, go ahead. Have you ever gone with your family to Selma? No, no, just hadn't worked out. The time hasn't worked out. Have you ever done the type of storytelling that happens at the Foot Soldiers Breakfast. Oh, yeah. yeah they, they know these stories about me. And, of course, they all read my book, Unfinished Agenda. You have proof of that? Do you have proof they read it? Well, they said they read it. 
they said, you know, I've often wondered, <laughs> I've often wondered if anybody has read that book, but it's just because I'm paranoid. But, uh, you know, you got to go with it. What does it feel like for you to tell these stories with your family? Energizing, energizing, because I see it from a new angle, especially with questions that people ask, like the questions you've asked of me today have uh, made me think about what we were doing in uh, Montgomery as really a separate set of uh, activities and not just as the the tail end of the Selma to Montgomery March as it has often been built. We were really doing our own thing to make sure that that bill to uh, safeguard the rights of Black folks to vote was actually passed. And it was passed in 1965 because of the Selma aspect, because of the Montgomery aspect, but also because of the other acts that people were taking on behalf of Black folks' right to vote all over the country, especially in the South. With what you said about why it was so important to go to Selma this year, what are you seeing happen in the country that is reminding you or bringing you back to that moment? that may have propelled you to clear the schedule and head down there and not just be there for the memories and the history, but to be there for the next wave of the movement. I see backsliding. I see retrenchment of the white supremacists. I see a whole new level of struggle, things that we thought were in by now, etched in stone with that law. But what with the Supreme Court knocked out the biggest safeguard in a recent case, which said that the federal government could monitor and look over the shoulder of what folks were doing in the South that had any kind of impact upon the right to vote of black people, such as certain kinds of redistricting, said voter requirements for voting. And yes, that was one of the factors why I wanted to go because, uh, it's a brand new case now. And a lot of young people don't see it as important because they question the right to vote. No, no. They question the necessity to vote. Voting is all right, but dot, 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 dot. So that's what I wanted to kind of tease out in the testimony. And as you will see, people will have different kinds of opinions on that as we go along. Hold on to your seats. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Francesca. But that's not the whole story coming out of Selma, the mecca for voting rights. There were others, other voices, equally as important. So we're going to present them and give them equal time, just as they were presented to me at Selma in the 57th anniversary Jubilee celebration. So come on back for the next episode of Everything's Political. You got to hear this one, because you might be surprised.
This is Junius Williams, your host on Everything's Political. Everything's Political podcast is sponsored by the Center for Education and Juvenile Justice and supported by the Terrell Foundation and listeners like you. It is produced by Mosaic Strategies with theme music by Anthony Ant Jackson. Like what you hear? Subscribe to Everything's Political Podcast on Spotify and follow us on Facebook and Instagram for exclusive